Hi, welcome. This is uh, another lecture series video. And this time, this is the video for all you with Irish or Scottish heritage, or who'd like to know more about the Vikings went down in the area around the Irish Sea and uh, what happened in those centuries, because it's, wow, it's an amazing story. Have you heard about Gallo Glass? Or uh, would you like to know uh, about some really famous people who have a straight paternal line going straight back to the Vikings? Well, let me show you in just a bit. Let me share your screen here now, like we always do in this uh, lecture series. So here we are. Vikings in Ireland and Scotland. And the funny thing is, I, I'm, I, I have to be honest, I'm a historian, right? But I've worked a little bit with DNA throughout the years, and I have a little focus on that. So um, this is not sort of like a history lesson in that sense, like if you're reading a history book, this is more using DNA and looking at how much Viking is there? in the Irish, for example, and we'll start with the Irish here. And it's been funny to see how many um, scientific report and strange news articles about Irish having more Viking DNA than previously thought, because every time there is a topic on it in the newspapers, uh, there's more coming, even more. And uh, this is from 2018, that's this to the, to the right here is from 2019. I'll come to the Scots, the Scottish, in, uh, in, uh, in just a bit, I'll start with the Irish. And uh, I just wanted to show this one. DNA test prove Scots clan are Viking, not Irish. This is the uh, MacNeils. Um, and and uh, I'd like to show you, this is from one of the newspaper article. They talk about this paper here. And uh, I'd like to show you down here in the blue here, because as soon as people and scientists and researchers started focusing not only on the Norse Vikings, but also on the Anglo-Normans and, and maybe later in the British plantations. Um, this percentage really went up. And I'll, I'll explain this in, in just a bit. And it's even higher, actually. Um, that's my prediction. So, so let me show you my, my thoughts on this. Here you can see the influence of the former, meaning Norse Vikings, is greater than previously estimated from Y chromosome haplotypes, meaning from father to son in paternal lines. And uh, this is from the conclusion of the same paper. It's also clear that historical migrations into Ireland have left a greater genomic uh, or genomic footprint than previously anticipated. And that's because they're looking at the um, patrilineal uh, genetics, and uh, which has uh, allowed the, the researchers here to detect a much greater Viking influence than previously estimated with Y chromosome data. And this is because we're talking about the Norse Gales. Let's just start there. This Norse Gale expression, that's, uh, it's really interesting because um, they use this uh, among themselves in the contemporary sources also, uh, meaning foreign Gales. Um, this is, uh, you can see here now, uh, Clan MacDonald, Clan MacDougall, Clan MacLeod. I'll get back to those clans later on. And the elite mercenary warriors known as Gallows Glass. I'll get to them also. Um, because they, it lasted for centuries. And also the boats and the influences there. And you can see on the map here on the right here, you can see how the islands coming down, the Hebrides, down to the Isle of Man here, and also down in Ireland. The, these are the five different areas where the Vikings settled. And uh, um, I'm going to show you more on that, of course, but let me just tell you about Norse Gales. They call themselves Östmen, or, and, meaning Eastmen. And um, in contrast, the Gales, uh, they call the Gales Westmen. Uh, so that's just something to, to, to notice about. And as we move on here, I'll use Wikipedia a little bit because I'll put a link, or actually several links down below, a list of, of all these links, because I want people to read up a little bit, maybe for themselves, if they, if they want to, uh, because I'm going pretty fast through here now, trying to give you guys an overview and uh, not going too much into the details. That's something one can do on the, well, I would have sat there for many hours if that was so. But you got to know that uh, Norse Gales, it's strongly connected with the later migration into Ireland from the Normans. 
and they're, they're called Hiberno-Normans, or are still called that, uh, and also Cambro-Norman families in Wales, because the Normans went into Wales, and I'll mention that also a little bit because it's, it's quite interesting. Just remember, please, that uh, there was a fusion here among Vikings and the Gales, right? They married into, just like I talked about in the other fam, uh, videos I have on the Rus Vikings and uh, the Vikings or Normans, the more Norman mercenaries who settled in Southern Italy, they always married into the local aristocracy, the local elite. That was the way to go, right? And you see it in Normandy and, uh, and you also see it here. Um, and it went on from the very start of the Viking Age, as we shall see. And some of those, they would mix, even the Normans would mix with the Norse Gaels, they would become what, what, what is called the Old English. I'll get back to that also pretty soon, because the, these are the ones who were called more Irish than the Irish themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And um, here is a map of the British Isles, and you see Ireland on the on the side there with all these five areas and the all different areas where the Vikings would have their most um, impact and then sail down. Uh, the Norwegian Vikings would come down here, of course. I'll show you in a map later on what kind of highway this was to us and still is in a sense. And the Danish Vikings would, uh, of course, take the uh, easiest way this way. And the Anglo-Saxons and the Utes would come up here because of all the trade with the Frisians and the Franks before the Viking Age, right? So there was a lot of common heritage here and similar gods, except for when Christianity came, of course, things changed quite a, quite a, quite a lot. And um, this is from a paper, a DNA paper from September last year, which I was a part of, a co-author in Nature, Population Genomics of the Viking World. Here, uh, one of the results is that um, two individuals from Orkney were buried in Scandinavian fashion, but they are genetically similar to present-day Irish and Scottish population. Present-day, right? But as we shall see and have seen a little bit, uh, there's quite a lot of Viking in that. But that's just proof. I mean, this is no surprise, really. That's just a proving um, in genetics also how they mixed the Norse Gales, right? And uh, let's start here now. I've got some maps here I'm going to show you going straight up the timeline. This is the first wave of Vikings in Ireland. And you can see here from the, from the different uh, dates, um, 847 in Dublin, right? That's two years after the, a great army went down to Paris and, and uh, got an amazing um, payment to not besiege the city anymore. This they did four times, actually. So that's 845, right? And this just made more and more Vikings come from Scandinavia. So here you have 847, but you have a lot of different um, uh, times uh, here, years here. And you can see they went all these different places, right? So this is the first raids and the Viking camps that they set up. And here you can see the result of this about, uh, let's see, um, uh, 950, so that's 80, 70 years later uh, from the last map. And you can see the five uh, dominions of the Vikings here. And uh, the Vikings in Dublin also had pretty much, uh, well, influence, it says here. And uh, Waterford uh, is the one city that the Vikings actually never left because they were driven out of Cork and Limerick and Weisford. And in Dublin, that's not a story. But I'll show you the next map here because we're moving on. I want to give you guys an overview before we dig in a little bit or dive in a little bit because something happened here in, you see Leinster. Uh, so the Dublin from the last map, the Dublin Vikings and the Weissfjord and the Waterford, they would merge essentially um, in a sense, becoming Leinster, which is the kingdom of Strongbow. Strongbow, I'll also show you some uh, details about him in a bit. So he was a uh, Norman who came after the conquest of uh, England in 1066. His family would then go on to um, invade Ireland. And, and, and we'll just, we shall see how that went. Because here you can see around 1300 uh, land held by Normans in blue and land held by native Irish. Now this went back and forth a lot, right? And as we shall see, things changed. Here you can see 
the Anglo-Irish Lords, which they were called at this time. Um, but these are the same uh, pretty much that they came earlier. But then you see the pale here, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you here now. Those who became more Irish than Irish himself, uh, in blue here, the descendants of Hiberno-Norman lords who had settled in Ireland in the 12th century had significantly uh, been significantly uh, Gaelicized, I guess that's how you say it, by the end of the Middle Ages. And they formed clans after the indigenous Gaelic pattern, but that's wrong because the Scandinavian Vikings, they had a very, very strong clan culture. It was very easy for them to merge and, and it has the same roots even as the Gaelic clans, right? So we got to bear that in mind. This was difficult for them at all. And they become known as, as uh, Old English, contrasting the New English to arrive with the Tudor conquest in the 16th and 17th centuries. And they were Protestant, but the Old English, they were um, Cath Catholics, of course. And you saw the pale here the, to the right around Dublin. That's uh, the dominion of the English king. And um, I just want to tell you something about the pale because now we're up on uh, getting close to the 1500s. Hiberno Norman occupation in the rest of Ireland at first faltered and waned. Across most of Ireland, the Normans increasingly assimilated into Irish culture after 1300. And this is important to know because this is the same as we see with those Vikings and Normans who settled in Southern Italy, in the Normandy and the Rus Vikings and in other places, they would always uh, after a while assimilate into the local culture. Also much because they intermarried much as um, of course it was strategic, but uh, it, it's a very good way to hold control over areas if you are in a mi minority, of course, it's the most logical way. And the Goths did it, the Swebi uh, of the po north of Portugal in Asturias, in, in uh, present day Spain did it, the Longobards did it. Um, this was the Germanic, the way of the Germanic tribes, which the Vikings also, of course, did. And they made alliances with neighboring Ottomans, Gaelic lords. And in long periods, there was no large royal army in Ireland because the Norman lords, like their Gaelic neighbors in the provinces, acted as effectively independent rulers in their own areas. So here you can see, um, this is something to learn, I guess, about Norman um, Viking descendants, just like the Longobards invited them down to southern uh, Italy as I talked about in my previous lecture series video. And um, it turns out they can adapt fairly easily to local traditions, local customs, languages, culture, and uh, assimilate. Uh, so, so it wasn't very good for the English uh, that this happened, but uh, then the plantations came. You see the time there and the Mary the first and Elizabeth the first and James, and this was devastating for Ireland. I won't get too much into that, but I'll say this. There had been small scale in blue here, immigration from Britain since the 12th century, right? After the Anglo-Norman invasion. And many of these settlers had assimilated as we talked about, right? And that's why uh, the English control, direct English control had shrunk to an area called the Pale. But then in the 1540s, they began, they began colonizing the island. And this, went, this was brutal. You see here down here, there is the Desmond rebellions and um, for those of you who are in particular interested of, uh, of Ireland, uh, here you can see a more um, detailed map on the different plantations. And uh, also you see on the top here, flight of the earls. The, uh, the earls who went, who left here, who fought against the English and left, they never returned. They hoped to gather uh, forces uh, in Spain and come back and, and reconquer, but that never happened. And they ended up down in Italy, in Rome, I believe. And, um, and that was devastating to the north. Um, and also the Desmond rebellions. Um, I, just want, I just want to show you this because this, you can see the names here, Fitzmaurice and Fitzgerald. Fitz is of course the son of, meaning these were Normans fighting the English, right? Norman Catholics from uh, who had assimilated into the uh, Gaelic communities. But most of these who, who left, we are uh, from um, the north 
who of course was mostly Gaelic, uh, especially in Northwest at that time. And the aftermath of these rebellions, I mean, after three years of scorched earth warfare by the English, Munster was racked by famine, and, and uh, 30,000 people had died from hunger. A plague broke out in Cork City. Uh, this is down south, right? Down south, southwest. And people continued to die of starvation and plague long after war had ended. And, and from here, man, it even, I mean, it got worse. It just got worse. And, and uh, if you want to see the situation in 1847, there's a great movie called Black 47, uh, which is so depressing to see, man. But it just, it's just getting worse, man. And also in Scotland, it wasn't easy in those years. But I'll, get, I'll move a little bit back in time now. I mean, further back to around 1300, to this map and um, the Anglo-Norman invasion of Ireland. The reason this went so well, in a sense, was because of uh, alliances. And at the same time, the, um, a lot of the Gaelic Norse had their different provinces that they were steering, right? And they get all, all the Gaelic. It was kind of like a um, opposition across the island. And probably it was easier to take advantage of this, such as um, Strongbow, as he is called, um, Richard Strongbow de Clare. Um, and uh, the Norman invasion was a watershed in Ireland's history, marking the beginning of more than 800 years of direct English and later. British involvement in Ireland. I'll show you um, another thing here, which is actually quite cool because they came, a lot of these Anglo-Normans, they came through Wales. They had tried to take Wales for several decades. And I know they must have learned a lot from that. And um, this uh, Grufud, Ab, uh, I guess it's, you say it's Sinan, but I, I know a lot of Welsh people, but I, I know I'm never going to try to talk Welsh or, talk, or, or try to pronounce these names. But see his age there, 81, 82. His, I mean, his life is just amazing. And he had, in fact, Viking ancestry, right, on his mother's side. So uh, he was king three times of Wales, and he had to escape a lot of times. And then he always went to his um, clan, uh, his family in Dublin, and, uh, and that family was actually from the clan of uh, Ivar Boneless, uh, they believe. So here you can see the mother of Gruffud was Ragnald Ingen Amleid, and uh, a granddaughter of King Sigtrid Silkbird. Uh, so she was a member of the strongest Viking clan in the, in, in the actual Viking age. Um, so, and uh, you have the coat of arms of Wales is actually to him, uh, Grufford here. And this is from when he escaped from uh, Chester. I've been to Chester, it's a great city to, uh, to, to visit, man, close to Liverpool, right? Um, so he escaped from here and his son and his great grandson, they were very, very influential. Those three, they, they reigned for a very long time, all three, and they have uh, been pivotal in the, the um, core, I guess, of Welsh independence history. Now, moving back to Richard Strongbow, he um, married, as you can see here, you can use Geni or Geni um, pretty much to search backwards on all these Normans and, and even present day with surnames. Um, you can actually go pretty far back. You can see Gilbert, Fils Gilbert, son of uh, Gilbert. And, and you can even go further back and see where they came from in, um, in Normandy, for example. And, um, and he even married this uh, Helena. Oh, I, the strong boy um, drink comes from uh, this man, by the way. Here is the great marriage of the Gaelic princess Helena and... Um, uh, their legacy, it says on, uh, on Wikipedia, uh, I found that quite interesting. Uh, their ancestors married into most of Europe's noble families. So that's something to bear man, in mind when you think about the legacy of this. And now we're getting back to the um, Vikings uh, in, uh, we're going to go a little bit back in time now, because now it's a Scottish turn. I just want to say that um, I could have made two videos here. Uh, and go much more into detail, but um, I prefer to keep the overview because in um, 
when studying these historical times, I guess it's always good to um, get the overview first and then you can dive in. And I'll show you something of the clan of, uh, of Ivar now, the, the historian here who wrote this book, Kim Yardar. He's one of those who proposed that uh, uh, it was actually Ivar the Bolness who was uh, part of uh, uh, or the founder of this clan. So we're going to uh, check that out now. Vikings still running rampant in Scottish DNA. Um, so uh, this is from the Scotsman, but it's from the festival, which is every year January. I do believe it probably wasn't this January, but anyway, up Heliar festival, they burn a Viking ship every January. And that's something I really want to take part of, man, on Shetland. Shetland is so close to where I live also. It's like just set boat and the next, if you go in the morning, you'll be there the next evening, ready for a beer in the, in the port of Ladwick. So um, I'll show you here now. I showed you this map earlier, right? Here you can see to the right the place names of to almost totally Norse character. And I'll show you later the DNA part of this also, because you can see this in the traces of DNA. And here place names of mixed Gaelic and Norse character. And you're coming down here to um, some Danish character also. Um, and... Uh, now is the time to show you this map. This is important. I live right here. I'm right here now when I'm talking here. And we're looking out into the sea almost too much of the time because we have to care about the weather all the time. But as you can see here, this is how I'm trying to show you how things looked for the Vikings. The sea was not a barrier. It was a highway. All right. Every place we stopped here on Shetland, Orkney, and down the Hebrides, they, they were clan members, family, kin, and you would stop and you would be well received and you would uh, all the way down to Isle of Man and, and down to Dublin and, and the North settlements. You would have news to come with, you would meet people and family and um, just the same strong clan culture in, in Norway is, 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 is what you met down here. And this uh, Norse Gael um, transition was probably very natural for all of them, as we know from the lords of these islands. And I'll show you a little bit about that in a bit. And the Faroe Islands is here. That's a great place to visit, by the way. And Iceland is here. So you can see how things might have looked for many people on the coast of, of, of Norway. And now we're looking at the Irish Sea, and this is place names also, right? The Isle of Man here. And look down here and on Liverpool, uh, the Virral down here and up towards here. Uh, there are so many place names which are orig originally Norse. So that should tell you something about the settlements here. As they met a lot of assistance here, the early Viking settlements around, I believe it was 902, many left and went first to Anglesey, which is here, and then onwards into present-day Northwest England. I have yet to see a proper and new DNA um, study being done on, on the English in the Northwest, in the Liverpool area, but I presume you would find some of the same that I will show you in just a bit. Um, also, uh, in terms of overview, I want you to look at this. This is the Kingdom of Man and the Isles. Now, this lasted for a really long time. Let me show you uh, first the dynasty here, House of Ivar, it was called. And, and uh, Imar is the founder local, uh, locally, right? That was Ivar. And, and that was a royal Norse Gael dynasty which ruled much of the Irish Sea region, the Kingdom of Dublin, the western coast of Scotland, including the Hebrides and some part of northern England from the mid 9th century. And, and there are scholars, as I just showed you, who believe that uh, this Ivar was actually the son of Ragnar Lodbrok. For all of you have seen the TV show Vikings. And moving on, I want to show you um, a little bit later, around 1200. Yeah, here, this kingdom was split in two. You have the territory of the Crovan dynasty, and then you have Clan Somerly, which is Somerled. I'll get back to him now. But first, I just want to tell you about the, the Crovan dynasty. Or actually, it's in the other direction. Uh, yes, we'll start with Somerled here. So Somerled, as it says in the top here, Somerled, that means the, 
the man who wanders in the summer, and probably the same way also, like a lad. That's this, we use that in Norway still. Um, and uh, he was a 12th century Norse Gaelic lord who, through ma marital alliance and military conquest, rose in prominence to create the kingdom of Argyll and the Isles. Right? And DNA has showed that he had uh, very much, not just on his mother's side, as people believed before, but also on his paternal side, um, Norse or, or Viking origin. In the blue and at the bottom here, this is a little relevant. Um, the Lordship of the Isles was ruled by Somerled's descendants until the late 15th century. And the significant figure of the Scottish, uh, yes, he was regarded as a significant figure, it says here, but there, Somerled is proudly proclaimed as patrilinear uh, ancestor by several Scottish clans. And recent genetic studies suggest that Somerled has hundreds of thousands of patrilineal descendants. And I saw um, there, there's this popular, it's not even a myth, it's proven, um, the person, the historical person that most men alive today descend from in a straight paternal line, that's Genghis Khan. And then a lot of people claim that Somerled is on the second place there. I, I would need to see some proof of that, but I think it's uh, plausible, absolutely. And then you have the Crovan dynasty. And this is quite interesting because they were very sea, um, uh, do you say sea bairn? Or, or um, they were very oriented to the sea. And um, they also had, as you see in the, in the bottom here, the military might of the dynasty where their fleet of galleys and their forces battled around here, here you can see. So the, the galley was very important to them. And that's a tradition from the Vikings, of course, which lived on after the Viking age. And you can, in many senses, say that uh, really the Viking age lived on in, in, the, in the Hebrides um, for, for quite some time. And even Iron Man for, for even longer time in the 16th, 17th uh, centuries even. And even today, the Lordship of the Isles that's uh, Charles, as you can see here, Prince of Wales. And, and as you see the founder, the founding, the creation date there, the year 875. I'll show you this also, because this has something to do with Norway. King Harald Fairhill's unification of Norway made, uh, he made a lot of enemies, but they all had to leave and they went down in this direction. So um, uh, when, and here you can see again, he sent his cousin, Chetil Flatnose, to regain control, but Chetil instead, he became king of the Isles himself. And um, they would continue to dispute overlordship of the area uh, for a, a really long time. I'm talking centuries here. So that's uh, quite interesting to know. And I'll continue you know, a little bit on the DNA because this is from a, a paper on um, uh, uh, this one Hapler group. And I explained in other videos here about DNA, the Hopra group of uh, Y chromosome, the Y DNA is the patrilineal or um, the straight paternal line from son to father and backwards, right? So if you look on this one Hopra group, which is called R1A, as you can see here to the right, R1A, and R1A, A, uh, sorry, R1A1, that's a distinct not Scandinavian haplo uh, group, a subgroup of the R1A group. Uh, the R1A group you find a lot of in, in present day Russia and, and, and Eastern Europe, by the way. And it's of course the Indo-European origin of, the, uh, of this. But you can, you, what's interesting in this uh, study from, from I believe November, 2020, uh, they look at the different subgroups here like um, GML8 and number nine, and also number, I believe, two here in orange is found widely, um, widely. And these sub lineages are relatively rare in the continental Europe, right? And absent in the Danish samples, but you find them a lot in, uh, in, uh, in Norway and Sweden. And 8% uh, uh, in Norway and 20% uh, in Sweden, uh, but that's kind of high uh, actually. Uh, of the um, R1A1, and uh, let me let me show you more uh, on the map here because here you can see from all the R1A samples, uh, or no, sorry, or all the R1A1 samples, here you have the percentage-wise, and you can see in 
this area that we're talking about here, Ireland is not part of the study. You can see from pink and purple that it's quite a lot um, from this distinct Norwegian and uh, and, and also Swedish uh, subgroup of haplogroup R1A. And, uh, and that should tell you quite a lot. And if you see here at the bottom, in Orkney and Isle of Man, by contrast, the para group R1A, GMLA8, GML8, predominates significantly with 86% and 79% of uh, R1A1, respectively. Uh, I won't get too much into this because I know this is difficult to understand for a lot of you, but I know a lot of people are familiar with this concept. And this is a very nice way to see uh, where Vikings have ventured. And it's only R1A, right? Most people look on the I1 haplogroup to search for the, for the, for the Vikings. But you can use this, uh, these two subgroups and, and, and maybe even GML2 also to, um, to search for Vikings like this. So let me go on to Galovglass because Galovglass, they were elite soldiers and they were used for a long time. And these are straight warrior class descendants out of the Gaelic Norse and the Hibernian Norse, this uh, hybrid, if you might say. And the Galovglass, um, were a class of elite mercenary warriors who were principally members of the Norse Gaelic clans of Ireland between the mid 13th century and late 16th century. These were the MacDonalds, McCabes, O'Donnells, and McSweeney's, and, and, and many other uh, families. And, and they are clans, I mean, and they were used abroad and on the European continent uh, quite a lot. And uh, I'm going to show you now a picture of one of uh, the most famous descendants of these um, Galloglass uh, people, because uh, Sean Connery, his both on his mother's side, which was McLean, and his father's side, which was Connery, goes back to the most famous and leg legendary early Viking clans. So you can say he was a Viking on both his um, paternal lines on his mother and father's side. And this famous mercenary soldiers, the Galavglas, they were uh, part of the clan MacGregor and were put into battle, as I said, all around Europe, even up to the 18th century. And uh, there are many stories about this uh, mythical um, yeah, um, uh, Galavglas uh, warriors. So um, let me show you another one. Yes, it's true. I've shown this in another video also, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it, more about it now. Donald Trump on his mother's side is Scottish, as many of you I'm sure know. And, uh, and his mother's clan uh, is Clan MacLeod. And Clan MacLeod was one of the most powerful and important Scottish Viking clans, but then lost everything twice over through battling with other clans and then being victims of a relentless onslaught of the English in the 18th to 19th centuries. So, so and I, I think this story can be told many ways, but it's, I, for me, I'm thinking it's a story of motivation uh, on how family history can work in mysterious ways because the Viking clan, the original Viking clan, McLeod, had so much and lost, almost went extinct. Extinct. If you if you read about the mother of um, Donald Trump and how she was born the youngest of so many children in the Outer Hebrides, and and they were poor man, and and to go over, she came after her sisters over to to England to New York. No, sorry, to USA to New York, and then married the father of of Donald Trump. I mean, that's something that I'm sure creates um, motivation. Uh, so, so this is a person who, on his mother's side, belongs to Clan MacLeod, a clan who almost went extinct and eventually re-emerged to have one of their descendants becoming the most powerful man on Earth. Imagine that. And uh, the Beatles, of course, uh, is interesting. Half of the Beatles came from Ireland as, uh, as workers in the industrial uh, revolution, the industrial era. Um, and they were p originally coming from Scottish clans, it's, it, sounds, um, it seems like. Scottish clans who fought against the Gaelic Norse clans. 
And uh, and uh, the other two on the back here, not John Lennon and uh, Paul McCartney, but Ringo Starr and George Harrison. George Harrison, he was uh, his paternal line, Y chromosome, goes straight back to the Normans who came into England. And um, I'm not sure if it was Normans who came from Ireland to Liverpool, but I don't think so. I think it was originally Norman English who came up and... Uh, uh, on his father's side. And Ringo Starr, he was one of those Gaelic clans in his line. So there you can have half of the Beatles have actually Viking roots in a sense, uh, to put it um, bluntly. And this guy, a man, he's a favorite of mine. Um, so so uh, Sir Michael Caine is uh, through his name, uh, Mikkel Wright. Mikkel, that, that means still in Norway, a, a lot, right? A lot of rights. And, and that's a story of the Dane law and the conquest of England by the Danes and Norwegians. And, and, um, and actually his surname, uh, Mikkel White, uh, also supposedly goes back to Voss in uh, Norway, which is uh, close to Bergen. And, um, and Gerard Butler, Butler is one of those uh, warrior Norse Gaelic clans. And uh, these two guys, do you recognize them? Well, it's... Uh, Brad Pitt to the right there and Tom Cruise to the left. I'll put up another photo, uh, switching them. Tom Cruise, through his surname, Mapother, uh, was probably one of Strongbow's Norse men who established themselves as Hibernian Norse in, the, in Ireland and uh, became the first Old English. As you may know, Tom Cruise, uh, his family, has been Catholic uh, from Ireland for, for, for a long time. And uh, Brad Pitt... Of course, also his, um, the Pitt family name reveals the story of the first Norman settlers in England and their legacy, which you can find if you search on, on GNI, uh, G E N I, Geni, as I say, and you can go backwards there also. It's quite fun to see if you want to search just the Y chromosome, but of course, with the autosomal DNA and all the families 214, 16, 32, 64, and all the way back. I mean, we're all so much related and it's been so much mixed. But the Y chromosome is interesting, though, uh, since it doesn't really mix that much from father to son. It doesn't change, right? So all in all, this is my story of, um, of uh, these Norse uh, Scandinavians who would come from one way or the other and settle on the British Isles. I just want to finish off by saying something about the Norwegian kings, because Magnus Barefoot as he's called here, um, he is reported to, uh, well, he tried to take Dublin and died there. And he was actually influential in helping um, this um, Gaelic lord uh, escape from Wales uh, to Dublin because he attacked Anglesey and the people in Chester had to fight it off and um, the English, I mean. So that's probably what, how he was able to escape. And, and the, the Nor Norwegian kings actually were quite involved for many, many centuries in trying to gain control here. And uh, Magnus uh, Barefoot, his he was son of, uh, of course, uh, King Harald Harald. And he tried to regain much of what his uh, father had, um, had, had brought in, which uh, wasn't a very smart thing to do, um, mind you, because that's not... Um, well, it didn't go too well for him at all, I will have to say. And um, there was another king that we should also remember, uh, rem remember because um, I, have, uh, I have him here. Oh, uh, by the way, I, I said that Magnus Barefoot was um, the son of Harald Harald. He was the grandson. I don't want to make a mistake there. But uh, here you can see the in the 13th century even, the... Uh, where you can see the Norway, the Norwegian Empire. We call it the North Sea Empire there, actually. If you search on Wikipedia for North Sea Empire, you, you'll find the Danish King Knut. And he indeed had a North Sea Empire in the early thousands. But uh, there was, in Norway, we call it a, a North Sea Empire that uh, uh, especially Håkon Håkonsen, King Håkon Håkonsen tried to establish in the, the uh, mid to late 13th century. And this is medieval Norway at its greatest, large parts of Sweden and, and down all the way into Isle of Man. It seems like even Engelsay is there for some reason. I don't, I don't think that was part of it. But anyway, um, he actually died, um, but he didn't die. Um, 
he, he died trying to expand his, his kingdom. And from there, as with uh, many of these Norse descendants in Ireland and Scotland, it just went downward and downward. And we call it the five century long nights uh, in Norway, actually. <laughs> so this is as, as large as the Norwegian uh, medieval Norway uh, became um, until everything turned around um, for some other uh, countries advantage, of course. So there you have it. I'm not sure how much time I spent um, recording this now, but I hope uh, this was quite interesting for um, all of you. And um, bear in mind, this is just a take from just looking a little bit on the DNA and, and very much focused on the paternal lineages. Uh, but as I've shown you in some of these papers, that's actually when uh, the uh, scientists have been most um, uh, surprised in the results and the conclusions on how much of this Viking, uh, well, the Viking men who left their imprint through the centuries and how long this legacy lasted, both in Ireland and Scotland, but of course, anywhere the Irish and the Scottish have went and they have went a lot, as we have seen and to many places around the world. Well, um, I see these headlines coming out and they still continue to do so. And now the sun is coming out. Ooh. Um, where the surprise is, look, the Irish and the Scottish have even more Norse DNA, more Viking in them, if you look on the paternal side. And before the sun takes me away, I will uh, wish you a great day and I hope, hope you uh, enjoy this. And uh, check out my other lecture series also if you, uh, there's a link down below if you, if you would like to. Take care and uh, thanks for your time.